Hello, everyone. This is Kelly Eversole, the Executive Director of the International Alliance for Phytobiomes Research. I'd like to welcome you to our webinar series today. We're joined by Allison Lopatkin from Columbia University, Barnard College, who will be talking with us about predictive biology. But before we get into the webinar, I'd like to give you a little bit of an introduction about the Phytobiomes Alliance. So we are a nonprofit consortium of industry, academic, and governmental scientists. And our sponsors actually enable us to have this webinar and to facilitate the coordination of research at the global level, research that relates to phytobiomes. So what is a phytobiome? It's a complex system of plant-based agriculture. It's the whole idea of a plant in a site-specific environment. And it includes all the different biological and geophysical components that impact that plant. And all of this is affected and influenced by management practices. So our vision is that all farmers will have the ability to use predictive and prescriptive analytics on their uh, based on their geophysical and biological conditions for determining the best combination of crops, management practices, and inputs for a specific field in any given year. And the idea there is to enable sustainability on a site-specific basis. We are still planning at this point to hold an in-person conference in September in Denver. So stay tuned and we'll be making a decision in February uh, 2021 as to whether we will postpone or do some components virtually. Uh, but we hope that all of you will, will stay tuned for the announcement and the call for abstracts if we can go forward with it. Our next webinar will be on the 11th of March, or at least our next planned webinar, and it will uh, look at the genetic dissection of disease resistance mechanisms hijacked by a necrotrophic pathogen of wheat. And you can go ahead and register for this already, and you can look at our entire webinar series uh, by going to the Phytobiomes Alliance website and you can register to get news about all the events that we are organizing. So just to give you a, before we open up the, uh, bring Allison on, the webinar will be recorded and will be posted on the Phytobiomes Alliance YouTube channel in a couple of weeks. Uh, you can subscribe to the YouTube channel as well, and you can get information every time we post something. The presentation section will be followed by a Q&A uh, period, and you can submit your questions in the Q&A panel. Please don't use the chat, but only use the chat to talk with fellow attendees or one of the organizers. Uh, and we'll try to get to as many of the questions as possible during the webinar, but once we have uh, completed it, we'll also try to to uh, answer all of the questions in writing and post those along with the, the video. Uh, you can download the handouts from the presentations in, uh, you'll see it in the handout panel, um, be my complete presentation and a modified version of Allison's because she's going to be presenting today some embargoed information uh, and we'll be releasing that uh, within the next couple of weeks. So at this time, I'd like to welcome Allison Lopatkin. She's an assistant professor of computational biology at Barnard College at Columbia University, and she's going to talk with us about predictive biology, understanding and reversing the evolution of antibiotic resistance. Allison, I will turn it over to you. Great. Uh, well, thank you for that um, introduction, and I'm really excited to be here and talk to everybody today. Um, I am guessing that some of what I'm going to talk about 
is potentially a little bit more basic science than maybe some of the talks that you are used to from the Phytobiomes Alliance, but hopefully by the end of today, uh, everybody will be on the same page and see why this is potentially extremely relevant um, to a lot of our uh, mutual interests here. So everywhere we look, we are really surrounded by so much predictive technologies from identifying fraudulent transactions uh, to maintenance of large machines to suggesting our next Netflix show to watch. Um, and in these cases, we've taken large data sets such as millions of hours of Netflix viewing, trained models on particular outcomes of interest, such as what sequence of shows you chose to watch, and use that to make some smart predictions about which ones you may actually want to watch next. And I don't know about you, but for me, sometimes these predictions have been remarkably accurate. For example, I'm a particular Lord of the Rings fan, and they have correctly assumed that after finishing the trilogy, I would want to watch The Hobbit next. So what went into that accuracy? Well, there's a lot of people who have watched both movies and there's some knowledge about the metadata surrounding that. So for example, these were both inspired by books written by the same author, directed by the same person, so on and so forth. But what happens when we take that knowledge or we take this link and we take it out of context? So what if, for example, all we knew was the name of the movie that we had watched and we had no idea that there were things like genres or directors or thousands of other relevant data points. Then I may have watched this movie and then I could have been suggested to watch The Ring next, which if you know anything about that is a very scary movie that I definitely would not have liked. And even worse, if we only knew that Ring itself was relevant, then I may have even been suggested to watch The Bachelorette, which, again, if you know anything about me, that's also nothing I would have enjoyed. And I'm guessing that people watching this have experienced something like this before, a prediction gone wrong. Um, but I think that sort of collectively, we're all becoming increasingly amazed at how accurate these predictions are getting. And in general, we only expect these predictions to become more accurate over time as we continue to add more data. So now, how has this been framework been applied to microbiology? Right? We know that unique microbiomes exist for nearly every environmental niche on Earth, each consisting of thousands plus uh, diverse strains and species and understanding the composition of these bacterial communities and how they change over time has been of particular interest and relevance for various environmental and also clinical applications. And as with these other cases like Netflix, we've started to accrue tons and tons of data thanks to um, next generation sequencing and omics technologies. And so in theory, shouldn't we be able to build similar types of predictive models? Well, it turns out that despite this wealth of data, microbial populations are still particularly challenging to predict, more so than maybe we would have thought originally. These are constantly evolving, changing, adapting, environmentally specific, and um, otherwise context dependent. And you may be arguing that humans are also complex, so why would bacteria be so much more difficult than, let's keep using my Netflix example, what's the main difference? Well, the largest difference is that for Netflix, they have a pretty good understanding of what type of metadata or what to focus on and incorporate into these models because we have a decent understanding of how humans make decisions, what drives our likes and dislikes. And so our inability to robustly and reproducibly fully predict complex microbial community dynamics really highlights a lot of our gaps in knowledge of what these important factors and features are to consider. And without that understanding, although we could throw all of our data at an ML or machine learning model and get something out, this would probably result in models that are uh, potentially hard to understand, likely overfitted, maybe not super robust or specific, um, or very specific rather, and as a result, not super useful to the larger community overall. 
And so to create these meaningful insights through machine learning, we really first need to understand what is driving these overall bacterial population dynamics so that we can know what to measure <clears throat> and ultimately predict it. <clears throat> and so to really get at that next step of accurately predicting bacterial dynamics in a robust and reproducible way, it requires, the way I like to think about this, a very integrative approach um, from these three complementary angles. And so the first is experimental characterization, meaning that this really requires well-designed, thoughtful, precise experimental measurements to better understand our system or whatever it is we're studying. The next is dynamical or mathematical models, which are mechanistic or semi-mechanistic representations, which in this case would describe how bacteria change over time. And that could allow us to test whether our understanding is at least partially complete or on the right track. And then finally, with those two combinations, you can uh, integrate machine learning or deep learning to really tease out the underlying relationships in larger data sets and bring it all together. And now all three of these are really powerful on their own, um, but to get a holistic understanding of uh, bacterial dynamics and make accurate and powerful predictions, the way I like to think about this, and I uh, think a lot of people are um, starting to converge in this place, which is that we really have to be uh, employing these aspects in tandem. Or in other words, just because machine learning is available doesn't mean we can forego these other uh, tools that are ultimately going to make our predictive models most valuable and most useful. And so today I'm going to talk to you about how I use this approach specifically in the context of antibiotic resistance. Antibiotic resistance is a growing worldwide threat. Um, for anybody who hasn't seen a recent article about it, it is um, pretty much everywhere uh, you look. The rate at which bacteria evolve resistance um, to our available drugs far outpaces our ability to bring new drugs to market. And it's been predicted if we don't do something about it, um, mortality from infectious diseases is going to skyrocket. Um, specifically resistant antibiotic infections, um, potentially becoming the leading global cause of death in our lifetime. Uh, and this is, or this map is really just showing you one example of a particularly dangerous multi-drug resistant pathogen that started from a single case and spread virtually across the globe in just 10 short years. And so the question really is, what do we do about this? And I like to think of it as a two-prong approach where we have to both develop new antibiotic therapies, but we also have to better utilize our existing drugs um, to prolong their shelf life. And it turns out that to do either of these most effectively, what we really need is better, more complete understanding of how antibiotics work so that we can not fall victim to the same traps as we have previously with this uh, surge and rise in resistance. And so for us, the story begins at how antibiotics work. We know that antibiotics target and inhibit key processes that are really important for bacterial cells to grow. So for example, some antibiotics inhibit DNA replication, and so they target key DNA replication enzymes. Some antibiotics inhibit protein production, so they target the ribosome, uh, so on and so forth. And so it's no surprise when you think about it that there's been this widely observed correlation between how fast bacteria are able to grow and how effective the antibiotic is at working. Or in other words, when bacteria grow faster, antibiotic works better. And this is our conventional understanding for many, many years. But more recently, there has been a growing appreciation for the role of metabolism in antibiotic lethality. And that work was pioneered primarily by Jim Collins and his group at um, MIT, but has now been expanded to many, many groups around the world where we've seen sort of two sides of this. 
which is yes, antibiotics will hit and inhibit those primary targets that I described, but that's not the whole story because once that happens, well, the cell tries to fight back. And in doing so, it mounts this stress response, which requires a whole lot of energy. And so it ramps up its metabolism. And as a consequence of overactive metabolism, it starts spewing off these toxic byproducts, for example, reactive oxygen species and things that are toxic to the cell simply as a result of extremely overactive metabolism. And that additionally contributes to lethality. On the other side, we've seen um, many, many, many other groups showing that when cells are metabolically dormant, uh, this, protects this protects bacteria from antibiotic treatment. And so overall, this sort of illustrates that our simplified or simpler understanding of how antibiotics work has become a little bit more complex, which means before we can simply apply some machine learning on different strains or environments and predict the emergence of resistance, we really have to do a little bit more digging and a little bit more measurements to figure out what the important phenotypes are uh, and genotypes to specifically look at or look for. And so we did just that. This was work we did a few years ago. Um, so in this recent study, we uh, showed that, yes, okay, growth is correlated with uh, antibiotic efficacy sometimes. But if you design your experiments super precisely and you allow the decoupling of growth and metabolism, or in other words, you have different experimental levers where you can individually tune the growth rate and individually tune the metabolic rate, then what you can see is that here on the y-axis, which is cell survival, and this x-axis growth rate, there was no real obvious relationship with growth and survival for three different drugs for all of these um, conditions that we tried. And yet metabolism showed a much clearer relationship where at low metabolic state cells were primarily surviving and then ultimately resulting in this downward log linear trend. And this might seem like a very subtle difference, but it's extremely non-trivial because it, what it suggests is that antibiotics preferentially kill cells with the greatest metabolic activity. And yet the consequences of metabolic selection and how that contributes to resistance up until now hadn't really been studied in depth. And so how can we possibly predict resistance completely accurately if we were never incorporating or even looking at metabolism? And so this question really underlies the theme of the two stories I'm gonna tell you about um, today, which is how does metabolism contribute to the emergence of resistance, incorporating predictive models and sort of showing you how this whole integration might work. And very quickly before I get there, a very brief overview, bacterial cells acquire resistance in two ways, either on the left, spontaneous genetic mutations that emerge by chance may confer increased resistance. And that would be selected for and propagated through bacterial division and clonal expansion. On the right, separate from genetic mutations, we have horizontal gene transfer. And this is the spread or the non-genealogical spread of resistance from one cell to another. Um, HGT is considered the primary mode of how resistance spreads. But the two stories I'm telling you about today really focus on um, each one of these aspects. And the first one I'm going to tell you about illustrates how predictive models guided our understanding of antibiotic mechanism, leading us to design our experiments a little bit better ultimately feeding back to improve our models. And the question we're asking here is, do cells evolve metabolic specific resistance mutations? So based on this updated understanding of how antibiotics work, the first step we do is we build the dynamic model to see how well we understand the system. In this case, we start uh, with our experimental data, which shows that survival on the y-axis overall decreases with metabolism on the x-axis. So this panel right here is just a subset of 
um, the data I showed you on that previous slide. And to model this, we begin with our original understanding that antibiotics inhibit bacterial growth. So here's just my um, simplified representation of the model that we're thinking of. Antibiotic A inhibits bacterial cell, uh, cell growth shown in N. But then we can add on our updated interpretation or our updated understanding, which is that antibiotics will activate metabolism following addition uh, to the cells. And this results in the production of some byproduct toxicity, which also inhibits or results in cell lethality. And so we test this model and we see how well it fits and it actually fits our data pretty well. And so, so far we're off to a good start. However, um, it doesn't all check out because this model suggests something else. Uh, and it suggests that if we're right, then one potential path for the evolution of resistance is in inhibiting this metabolic cascade of events. All right, so this model, if correct, would suggest that we should be seeing evolution occur through this pathway that I have a big X on, in addition to these other mechanisms that we know about. And this does not match what our existing experimental data shows right now, because as it stands currently, our mechanisms of resistance fall into three main categories at a very high level. And these uh, involve things like drug transport, so increasing the rate at which cells pump the drug out or preventing the drug from becoming um, internalized, modifying the drug target so the antibiotic can't bind, or degrading the antibiotic entirely. And none of these tell us that altered metabolism is a pathway by which resistance can emerge. And so if metabolism is so important or if our model is correct, then why is that? And so our best guess has or had to do with the way in which evolution experiments were designed. And so typically, the way we study resistance in the lab is by these experiments called adaptive evolution, laboratory, adaptive laboratory evolutions. And the way these work is we introduce a population of cells and we slowly increment up the antibiotic concentration in rounds of growth, and we slowly increase that drug concentration, selecting for uh, the most resistant cells in the population. And so when you think about what's happening here, we're introducing antibiotic, and we are requiring the cells to both survive the treatment and grow the fastest in the presence of their entire population, ultimately doing what I'm going to refer to as a growth-dependent selection. And we said, well, what if we change this protocol? And instead of doing a growth dependent selection, let's try and see if we sort of flip it a little bit. And instead of having growth dependence, we look at metabolic dependent selection and see if that changes the types of resistance that emerge on the bench. And so what we did here is instead of slowly increasing the antibiotic concentration, we slowly increased the metabolic state of the cell. And in this particular case, we did that by increasing the temperature under which treatment was occurring by a single degree every day. And we only treated the cells for a very short period of time. And so what you have is high concentrations of antibiotic with low metabolism to begin with. And at the end, you ultimately are in theory selecting for cells that have active metabolism, but able to withstand the treatment. And so we uh, did these two protocols side by side with the same three antibiotics. And so on the left, you can see that in the growth dependent approach, there is uh, what we would expect to happen, which is a decline in the population because every day we're slowly increasing the antibiotic concentration. Ultimately, we surpass their adaptation threshold and eventually the populations die out. On the right hand side, that doesn't happen because treatment is only for a short period of time. And so everything survives till the end. But we take the final populations and we can measure how resistance 
uh, changed between the starting population to the ones that survived. And so here are the three drugs we use, each panel, and the x-axis here is increasing concentration of that drug. And the y-axis is cell density. So when you see that line cross down to the x-axis, that shows the concentration of the drug that is able to inhibit growth, or what's known as the MIC, and it's a measure of resistance. And so the wild type cells in gray are um, the least resistant, but you can see that for both the classic evolution and the metabolic evolution, resistance did evolve and it did emerge. And the classic evolution had higher levels of resistance, which is not necessarily surprising given how the classic evolution protocol is designed. But certainly from these results, we wanted to know what these mutations were. So we did some deep population and clonal sequencing. And here I'm just sort of summarizing the types of genes or the types of mutations that we found. On the left, the most common gene that was hit in that evolution was classified as response to antibiotics. That's here. Again, not surprising. That's how the um, experiments are typically designed. So when we did it too, we also found genes that were primarily involved in our classic resistance mechanisms. On the right-hand side, though, we found a very different set of mutations that emerged. Uh, focused on the generation of precursor metabolites and energy. And the important thing to point out here is that neither of these two protocols are uh, environmentally or clinically relevant. Right? None of these are necessarily telling us what is most important for what happens with antibiotic selection in the real world, because both of these are in vitro. And the only reason we know these are important, right here, these on the left, is because we've found those mutations before and we looked in isolates that are from the natural environment and we know that they are there too. And so we did the same thing and we screened a library of over 7,000 E. coli pathogens. About half of these are environmental and about half are clinical. And we looked for the total abundance and relative abundance of these metabolic mutations to these more classic ones. And I guess I should say, first, we found several mutations that were not present in any of these pathogens, meaning that those ones likely are specific to the in vitro environment that we're using. But we found many mutations of the canonical or these classic mutations present in this library of pathogens. And those I'm highlighting with the blue dots here, and you can see they span a wide range of prevalence, where prevalence of the mutations is the y-axis. And when you compare those classic antibiotic mutations to the metabolic mutations we found, these ones were just as prevalent, in some cases more prevalent, in some cases less, but certainly there, in some cases significantly overrepresented in the clinical or environmental genomes, very much suggesting the relevance of these metabolic mutations as well. And as the final test, we introduced the um, mutations into strains and uh, wanted to know if they actually do confer resistance. And in um, all of the cases that we found, these mutations in metabolic genes uh, did confer resistance. On the y-axis there is the um, MIC value again to at least one drug and in some cases more than one drug. And so this was really exciting for us to find, right? Because at this point, we can now go back to our model. And we have enough data to circle back around and say, yes, we think we found some uh, evidence for this link. Now let's use the model to test and see whether that's true. And so one example here is the model suggests that if you have resistance here, then some stra these strains will potentially be more sensitive to direct stress, just because they're not expecting it at all. And when we did those measurements, the simulations and experiments matched very closely, which is further supporting and providing evidence for this as a mechanism, an additional mechanism for resistance. And so now we have a strong foundation to um, think about 
where might we go with some predictive or machine learning models. And as an example, we can use this information to design smart experiments that tease out how metabolism impacts antibiotic efficacy. And so in a nice study led by my collaborator, Jason Yang at Rutgers University, he used machine learning uh, to connect changes in antibiotic sensitivity uh, in response to an array of metabolic perturbations. And in doing so, uh, he was able to identify pathways related to nucleotide metabolism that clearly impacted antibiotic susceptibility. For example, supplementation with uracil, which is down here in the blue line, significantly increases the respiration rate. And supplementing with uracil also significantly, uh, significantly potentiated antibiotic lethality. Likewise, he found several um, examples where you could protect the cells from treatment by perturbing nucleotide metabolism in the other direction. Our findings also showed that metabolic mutations uh, arose in a very diverse way, meaning that we found a lot of different metabolic mutations. And if you just use a completed whole genome and try to identify or predict mutations that confer resistance across you know, a wide range of strains, this would actually appear like noise because compared to canonical or classic antibiotic targets, these are much less conserved. Um, I should say conserved at the nucleotide level rather than they are conserved at the functional level. And so your sort of typical machine learning approach uh, wouldn't work in that case. It wouldn't allow us to tease out and pull out these metabolic mutations. But in the simplest case, if you do a gene by gene approach, um, for example, here I'm showing you uh, SUCA, S-U-C-A here, which was one of the main, um, one of those resistance mutations that we found in our evolution and did a lot of uh, follow-up work on. And you do a targeted machine learning um, approach here. We used a simple uh, uh, random, random forest classifier. Uh, we were able to pull out the specific mutation in SUCA that conferred resistance that was so prevalent in all the genomes. And so overall, what that story um, ideally highlights is that predictive models inform our experimental designs to better increase our understanding of the biology. We found that metabolic mutations were highly prevalent in pathogens. These mutations independently confer resistance. And now these mutations let us uh, redesign the way we may uh, train or incorporate machine learning to better predict and understand antibiotic lethality. And so that was the first story. The second story is now going to take a little bit of a uh, step to the side, which is no longer looking at the sort of spontaneous evolution of genetic mutations. Now we're gonna talk about horizontal gene transfer. And this story specifically talks in sort of the reverse direction, which is we have experiments, we can make very precise measurements. Now let's build a model and see how we can um, expand that. And so here our question is, how, do, um, meta how does metabolism, because that is our main interest, inf uh, indirectly influence resistance dissemination? And so like I said earlier, horizontal gene transfer is considered the primary way that resistance can spread on the global scale. In general, this is um, primarily believed to uh, be driven by the process called conjugation. And conjugation is the transfer of often plasmid DNA from one cell to another through direct cell-to-cell -cell contact. For anyone unfamiliar with what a plasmid is, plasmids are these circular pieces of DNA that can self-replicate and often encode one or multiple antibiotic resistance genes. So what that means is through conjugation, we can generate a completely multi-drug resistant strain in just a matter of minutes, simply by knocking into or coming into contact with a donor strain that carries those genes. 
And so that's pretty frightening when you think about it. Um, and here's a video to scare you even more if that wasn't scary enough for you. Um, this is going to show you uh, sort of what the idea of conjugation looks like in action. And so this is an experiment that uh, we've done where the donor cells are tagged with green fluorescence. Recipients have red fluorescence. And the donor cells um, also have a unique resistance gene. In this case, it's canamycin. Sorry. And canamycin and the green fluorescence are both located on that conjugated plasmid, which means that when it gets transferred to the recipient, we generate transconjugants that have two unique features. The first is resistance to canamycin, which is transferred, and then also chloramphenicol, which is a feature of the recipient strain. But also they have both green and red fluorescence. And so this is showing you what that looks like. Here we have recipients and donors mixed together and growing happily until right there where we introduced both um, both antibiotics there at high selective concentrations. And what that does is that kills off the donors and recipients and uniquely selects for transconjugants or uniquely selects for the cells that have resistance to both antibiotics. These appear yellow by eye due to the spectral overlap of GFP and M. cherry. And that very much sort of gives you a microcosm of what antibiotic selection on conjugative plasmids can do. Right? We didn't see the yellow cells to begin with, but once we started selecting for them, they emerged. And so now we want to understand how metabolism impacts conjugation dynamics, especially knowing that metabolism impacts antibiotic susceptibility. And we can break down conjugation dynamics into very precise experimental measurements. And you can think of this as two processes. The first is the rate at which the plasmid gets transferred. How fast does one cell give the plasma to another one? And that is, I'm going to call the conjugation efficiency. The second part of this is the growth dynamics or how fast do the cells grow once they have a plasmid compared to the ones that don't. And so we can measure very precisely that conjugation efficiency. We can measure how um, fast a plasmid is transferred from one cell to another. And we can measure this as a function of very uh, wide range of environmental factors to see how different um, exogenous uh, aspects can modulate the conjugation efficiency. And so on the left, I'm showing you that the conjugation efficiency on the y-axis very much depends on different perturbations to cellular metabolism, but more relevantly, um, to people here, this depends on the environment and the nutrients and the physiological states of the bacterial cell. So glucose increases conjugation efficiency. Cells that are in stationary phase or quiescent have a much lower conjugation efficiency. And even genetics impact conjugation efficiency um, because here I'm showing you that stock A mutant that I showed you before in comparison to a very common classical mutant uh, gyrase A, and these two strains have very different conjugation efficiencies. And so metabolism does impact conjugation efficiency, and um, here I'm showing you it also impacts growth. Um, typically, plasmids impose metabolic burdens due to the extra resources that they have to use in order to maintain it. And you can measure this by calculating the growth rates between cells that do and do not have a plasmid. And that's here on the y-axis, um, which is the growth rate. And you can see the orange bar is a little bit lower than the blue one, meaning that the cell carrying the plasmid is growing a little bit lower, a little bit slower, rather. And this metabolic cost is entirely dependent on the environmental conditions, which can be modulated. And so we can decrease the cost, which is just the ratio of these two bars over here. We can decrease the cost by making it beneficial to carry that plasmid, for example, adding in an antibiotic that selects for it. And we can increase that cost by increasing the metabolic burden of carrying that plasmid. And again, we can change that cost by uh, changing the strain genetics. 
And these were again some strains from our other evolution, and these all had different plasmid costs due to the metabolic makeups of the cells. And this is all well and good, and we can make really precise experimental measurements, and that's great, but how relevant is that, or does it matter at all? Um, because sure, metabolism may influence conjugation dynamics, but how does that translate to how resistant spreads in natural microbial communities? Microbial communities are extremely complex, obviously, consisting of many diverse interacting strains and species that are connected through extremely diverse webs of gene exchange. And so we start simple to try and understand this a little better, and the goal is to eventually get up to something as complex as this. But let's look at what this might look like in the simple case. So we started with the experiments and now we're moving to the modeling. And here is my uh, schematic for this particular model. And this one's pretty simple because we only have, in the simplest case, two populations. On the left, the blue cell has no plasmid. If it gains the plasmid, it becomes this red cell. And that occurs at a certain rate or the conjugation efficiency, which we can measure experimentally. This red cell can lose the plasmid at a certain rate. We can also measure that experimentally. And then they grow at a rate relative to each other, otherwise known as the plasmid cost. This is obviously very simple, but before we start making it more complex, let's first just uh, get a little bit of uh, foundation and make sure that at least our simplified explanation holds up and is true or checks out. And so given this first simple model, we test this experimentally. Are these measurements enough to predict the dynamics in a population? The left is the modeling and the right is the experiment. And that blue line is showing you that the cells without the plasmid over time actually decrease. And the plasmid carrying population ultimately dominates. And from our experimental results, Right next to that, you can see it is a very, very good match. But now let's start to make things a little bit more complex because this model can be expanded uh, to as complicated as we want it to be. Um, and that depends on how many strains and species you want to introduce and how many um, measurements we want to make on how many plasmids or how many mobile genetic elements. And in just this example, we're using a three species, three plasmid system. Uh, and again, the model on the left very much upholds the experimental predictions on the right, uh, showing that at least for these still synthetic but more complicated systems, these features or these parameters that uh, describe conjugation are uh, fairly sufficient to account for the dynamics that we see. But the cool thing about this model is we can start to get some analytical insights or intuition into what is driving these dynamics, again, to try and identify those features that we want to use for ultimate predictive modeling. And what this model actually tells us mathematically is there is some critical conjugation efficiency. And if a plasmid is conjugating at a rate faster than that, then it will survive. It will be able to persist and spread through population. And that's here in the orange line. But if that plasmid does not surpass that critical conjugation efficiency, it will be eliminated. Uh, and that's the next figure over with this orange decaying line. And so of course, we want to test this again to make sure that our model understanding is correct before we expand even farther. And so we took nine natural plasmids and we measured with our model to predict whether or not it would uh, pers persist or not would that plasmid remain in the population. And in all nine of these cases, we did predict that it would um, indeed persist. And experimentally, that was the case for all of these uh, plasmids. And so here on the right, the orange lines are the ones with plasmas, if we were once without, and they all survived. And that might be a little bit uh, unfortunate because ideally we want to be removing plasmids from the environment, um, or at least having some control over the plasmids in these environments, certainly reducing resistance on plasmids in the environment. 
And so we look back at our model and realize all is not lost because it shows us how we can leverage metabolism in order to reverse resistance. And basically what this model is telling us is for these example plasmids, the efficiency is too high and the metabolic burden is too low. And instead, if you leverage the metabolic burden and inhibit conjugation and combine, you can flip that criteria and you can remove or eliminate these plasmids from the environment. And so we found two compounds that did just that, that one inhibits conjugation and two promotes um, plasmid loss through increasing the burden. And we remeasured our parameters to make our predictions. And we found that for four of the plasmids, our model now predicts that these plasmids will be reversed. Or in other words, these plasmids will be removed from the population. And for those four plasmids, that's exactly what we saw. Once the model predicts reversal, we can now visually watch and see that that plasmid gets removed or is eliminated. From the other five uh, plasmids, although the model did not predict reversal, it did predict a reduction in that criteria, which simply means that in no case did it fully remove, but we did see a suppression um, in the trend or in the um, invasion of that plasmid, so to speak. And so that was really exciting. And, uh, before I just wrap up, this is now setting the stage for all of our next uh, studies on how to leverage this information. And so, for example, based on our understanding of our dynamic model, we're starting to build machine learning models that further interrogate and predict these outcomes of interest. Knowing that metabolism impacts both conjugation and that changes in metabolism may confer uh, resistance one of our main projects is building predictive models that aim to identify trends between specific resistance phenotypes and metabolic alterations. And to do that, just as an example, starting out um, something that's wrapping up right now is building library of thousands of plasmids to look for associations between um, metabolic functions and resistance types. And we can see clear links. Uh, and this will help us get a mechanism and this will help us better understand how and why certain plasmids spread more easily in environments uh, when they're linked to specific resistance mechanisms. As another example, we have a lot of ongoing work that looks at how different environmental factors impact the conjugation efficiencies and growth rates and using them to predict dynamics in environments of interest. And so, for example, um, given the high accuracy of this HGT kinetic model. Um, we're collaborating with um, uh, Carrie Hamilton at ASU and some uh, folks at other institutes on integrating these kinetic models into um, uh, quantitative microbial risk assessment models um, to start to incorporate this idea of horizontal gene transfer as a real element contributing to the spread of resistance. And then other work again in sort of that same vein is really looking at which factors are the most important in modulating these conjugation dynamics with a whole bunch more plasmids and a whole bunch more relative, uh, relevant strains and species. And so from this second story, hopefully I've shown you and hopefully you're on the same page as me now that conjugation efficiency and growth dynamics uh, do depend on met uh, bacterial metabolism that modeling can accurately predict this plasmid persistence. And as we start to get into more complex um, environments, then we can start to better understand the um, factors which promote and suppress the uh, spread of these elements in complex communities. And just to bring your attention back to the paradigm from earlier, that clearly this can be investigated from any direction, um, but truly it is the combination of all three that is particularly relevant to predicting microbial dynamics, especially in the context of antibiotic resistance. And it is primarily founded on a really strong basis of experimental measurements and understand, understanding what and how uh, the important features are that you are interested in measuring and then beginning to scale. Um, and with that, I am again so thrilled that I was able to share this work with you today.
Um, there are a lot of people for many years that were uh, essential and critical for this, and it couldn't have been done without any of them. They're all listed here. Uh, and if anybody uh, is interested in asking questions now, or feel free to email me at any point later, I'm always happy to discuss um, all of this uh, work and others. And thanks for listening, and happy to take questions. Great, thank you very much, Allison, for a, an extremely interesting webinar. Um, in agriculture, we are always fighting and struggling against resistance of one thing or another, whether that's uh, resistance to a disease or resistance to a particular treatment for uh, pest, uh, et cetera. Do you have any recommendations for how we could integrate this in a system that like in plants for example we can actually change things in the plants unlike what we can do in humans so do you have any recommendations in that regard for how or ideas on how you would set up some of those experiments yeah so it really is all about finding the sort of important features to distill into sort of a modeling framework that i that i showed you in two different examples it's once you can identify the, the main arms that are contributing to whatever problem at whatever scale, right, whether you're talking about within a single bacterial cell or at the level of an entire um, ecosystem, you can make the measurements knowing what those important features are. So sort of sitting down and distilling the sort of where the resistance um, is coming from, what the most important features that we know of right now that are uh, contributing um, and important in whether it's seasonality, whether it is um, you know, location, wh whatever those sort of main aspects are for whatever is the question of interest and start taking measurements because that is the really most important um, part to these models. Yeah, so in, uh, in wheat, for example, there's been a lot of studies in metabolomics uh, regarding drought and drought resistance. Um, how would you incorporate that with microbial communities or the microbiome? How can do you have a recommendation on how we could bring those together, both the metabolomics of the plant plus the microbial communities that may be in a field? Yeah, so and, I, and you're saying you have the measurements for microbiomes already? Is that the scenario? Um, no. Or those aren't no. even taken yet? Yeah, so, so the starting first... from fresh, you know, because we've got, we, there's been a lot of work on, on uh, metabolomics and wheat, but, and it's been going on for a number of years, but there's limited work on how that is impacted by the microbial communities. So how do you bring all of those together? Or yeah, so that, that's a, so I love, I love that question because there's so many parts to that um, and there are I guess many ways of going about doing that but really uh, it's an amazing data set if, if there is good metabolomics data sets in sort of well documented and controlled environments and we can go back in and get um, microbiome sort of metagenomic data uh, to pair with it then that's really an amazing um, starting place to look at correlations and trends in um, yeah, the metabolomics at the plant level to what is underneath. So that, that needs the microbiome measurements to start making those connections. But once you have that, um, you can really start to dive in and try and distill down uh, sort of the, the simplest possible um, model framework that fits the data that's there. From a standpoint of, of trying to design such an experiment, um, and particularly when you've got, we've got data over a period of years regarding metabolomics for wheat, especially as it relates to drought, but perhaps not as it relates to resistance to disease or something. Um, how much data do you actually need before you start getting robust results? How much data on the metabolomic side? How much data on the microbial communities? Whether it's in a controlled environment setting or in situ. So I guess it really depends on the specific question. Um, if, if if you're talking about something 
very specific to a uh, you know, specific geographic region and area. Like as, as you get more specific, the least amount of data you need. Um, but of course, if we're talking, if, if, if this data is coming from an extremely wide range of um, many different scales and um, things like that, then you start to at least a representative amount of microbial data points to start making those connections, meaning that one or two microbiome samples is really not going to, to do it. You would really need um, from both, yeah, ideally controlled, so throughout and not, and, um, and over time, since that's where the metabolomics data is also um, being measured, at least a few, several, da several data points in, in, in all of those sort of quadrants. Yeah, so you didn't mention deep learning in, in your presentation. Is that something that would um, be conducive perhaps to these extremely large data sets? Wheat, for example, is the most widely grown crop in the world. So there are metabolomic studies from all over the world. Um, is deep learning uh, something we should be looking into in terms of trying to understand resistance better? Yeah, so I think that for something on that scale, you really have to approach it from both angles, um, meaning that deep learning is certainly going to let you um, sort of identify the main features, ideally, um, that are driving or important in the uh, phenotype outcomes you're looking at. Um, but if you wanted to really make a directed and specific sort of therapeutic intervention, then you would really need to take that deep learning, which I probably agree, given the scale of, of how you're describing it, is a good place to start. So in my circle, you, I think that deep learning is probably the right, way, the right place to start there. Um, but then taking those predictions and actually testing them uh, in a more controlled environment so that you can deduce whether or not the model is functioning as you want. And only then can you really come back to any type of therapeutic intervention. So one of the things that is happening in agriculture is there's an increased use of what we call microbial biologics, where we're creating a community that can um, substitute for fertilizer, uh, synthetic fertilizers or synthetic chemicals. Um, and as a result, we're lo really looking at what microbes are there and what microbes could actually increase productivity or that can be disease resistant, et cetera. So as you can see, that starts when you start adding that layer on top and maybe you're not going to change the um, metabolism of the plant, but now we're looking at can or can we change the metabolism of the plant by changing the microbial community or adding microbes to a seed uh, or in furrow applications of a particular biological. I mean, ha, do you, what would you see and recommend in terms of those? So, I mean, I think the, what you just described is really the ultimate controlled experiment of taking natural communities, putting it in a more controlled environment with the plants of interest and start doing specific measurements of community to metabolic, to, to plant metabolism outcomes. Um, and then uh, yeah, using that information to, to build a model that predicts plant metabolism from microbial community. And can you add another layer which would include the environment? So you have weather, we're gonna add weather data because once you, even though it might work in a controlled environment, it might not work under certain uh, weather conditions or environmental conditions. Right, so you can add, as, so as long as you have the data, like you can add as many layers of complexity as you want, and as you add the layers, you need to increase the sampling and the data. Um, so it's really just a question of, of scale and limits in terms of how much you're able to, to yeah, how much money, how much data. Money, money is a big one there, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but is there is there a limit to the amount of data you want? I mean, do you reach a point where you've got too much data? It's a really good question. So for 
something like that on that scale, I think the short answer is nobody really knows exactly what the right balance of data is going to be for that. But that's something that you sort of test. I mean, that that you can test whether a model is overfitted. You can you can you can make those changes once you have something to start working with. Um, likely, there is a point where more data is always so right in the case of Netflix, more, more data is better. So once you know exactly what you're looking for, then and you know what to measure, then that data becomes extremely valuable, and you want to continue measuring as much as possible. But until you know exactly uh, or or the main features, then you're sort of limited by taking the measurements that um, fit into the proposal scale or whatever it is that you can, and sort of casting a wide net and trying to figure out what those important um, aspects are going to be which I agree will be driven by a deep learning model that will allow you to generate predictions. And start to see the patterns or right. the, the relationships, correlations, right. et cetera. So very interesting. So thank you very much, Allison, for a great webinar. As we mentioned, the uh, video of the webinar will be placed on our YouTube channel in several weeks, as well as the more detailed, complete uh, presentation today. And uh, again, you can sign up for future webinars, and we hope you'll do that uh, by going to the Phytobiomes Alliance website. And uh, we look forward to seeing you at our next webinars. So thank you for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Bye-bye.